Hello and good evening, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful weekend and are ready to uh, have a look at another of our webinar. And of course, we do have another interesting topic. And of course, we do have another special guest. And uh, some of you possibly already know this is Dr. Vladimir Silva. And hello, Vladimir, how are you feeling tonight? It's wonderful to have you back, that's for sure. Hi, Caroline. It's always a pleasure to be here with my IVF answers. Um, like you know, um, for me, I always have to congratulate you for this initiative because it's really good to be here sharing experiences, talking directly to the public. So uh, <laughs> always nice to be here with you. And as you know, it's always amazing to have you back as our presenter. So thank you so much for joining us once again. It's a real pleasure to have you here for sure. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, our topic tonight is on uh, embryology once again. Uh, so Vladimir will tell us about uh, what's happening in the embryology lab. So uh, he will start with his presentation on that topic. But afterwards, as always, we will have time for your questions. Don't forget, put those in the chat section and uh, Vladimir will, will take care of them uh, right after the presentation. And of course, I'm your host, Caroline, and I'm, I'm very happy to be back with all of you. And uh, as you know, my IVF Census is a part of European Fertility Society. And we are simply here to support you, to uh, answer some of your questions, but also give you the opportunity to um, get to know some of the top fertility experts like like Dr. Vladimir is, of course. And for those who don't know yet, at least, uh, Dr. Vladimir Silva, he is the IVF uh, director, but also co-founder, actually, of uh, Ferti Centro uh, Clinic, which is uh, located in Portugal. So welcome back. And I guess we can now start with your presentation then, OK? OK. Well, Perfect. thank you, Caroline. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm here to talk about the IVF lab. Um, I'm actually starting to share my screen. Um, let's hope this works well. Okay, here we go. Um, so um, I will start by introducing myself. Like Caroline was saying, uh, my name is Vladimir Silva. I'm the CEO and head of the IVF lab at Ferti Centro. Uh, I am also the CEO uh, at the Procriar, uh, another clinic in Porto. Um, and so this presentation today is about what happens inside the IVF lab. It is undoubtedly a very mysterious place. We, as patients, uh, we send our samples in, but we don't know what happens next. It's a mystery, and this is what we're talking about today. Well, let's start with the sperm. What happens? Where does it go? Well, when mentor enter the collection room, uh, they do what they have to do, and then they hand us the famous cup. It is passed to us via a window, a window where you cannot see the other side, at least in our clinics, and then this, the bottle is left in there and men very often think, what happens next? Will they swap my, uh, my sample by another man? Obviously, no. Uh, we identify samples in many ways with the name of the patient's wife, the name of or his female partner, if applicable, if it's uh, if we're just freezing the sperm, uh, we identify it with the name of the patient always with the internal code for the patients and always with internal code for the patient's wife. There is subject to multiple verification procedures and double witnessing. Um, and so there is uh, there is always a total traceability. There are people uh, assuming their responsibility for sample ID and paper in patient identification. So every so every patient can feel absolutely sure uh, and safe about that. Then what we do with the sperm, we analyze it at the microscope. Uh, we count the sperm, we, count, we, we assess its concentration. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, it has to be more than 15 millions per milliliter. We also assess its motility. A normal sperm has to have more than 32% progressing spermatozoa. And we also evaluate its morphology. That has to be, uh, we have to have at least 4% of normal spermatozoa 
or among many other parameters. Uh, sometimes we need to prepare the sperm, sometimes we have to use concentration techniques. There are multiple procedures that we can do um, depending on what is the aim uh, of our um, of what we're doing. When we take a look at the sperm uh, at the microscope, this is actually what we see. See, it looks like little dots, little uh, flying dots under the microscope. These are real spermatozoa. <laughs> Let's take another look again. It looks very messy, but obviously there are ways to count, control, and assess uh, its concentration. So this is so you can have an idea what we can see in the lab. So how do we count the sperm? Well, we have these chambers. This, in this case, uh, we use a Muckler chamber at our clinics, and so. Uh, we have this uh, little square network and according to the number of spermatozoa in each square we make the proportion to assess the concentrations there are parameters minimum numbers of spermatozoa to be counted in order to establish the motility minimum numbers of spermatozoa to be counted uh, when we are assessing the concentration but Roughly speaking, it is we use a proportion technique. Okay, so when we say that there are 15 million sperm per milliliter or 39 million spermatozoa in total in a sperm sample, we're not actually counting until 39 million. It would be impossible. We work with proportions. We have these special chambers that help us to um, indirectly assess the amount uh, of sperm that we have uh, with us. And so this is how it looks like when we are looking in the microscope you can see the the squares and we can see how many sperms are there in each square and we can see how many of them are moving how many of them are not moving how many of them have in situ motility this would mean that they are sort of laying there just uh, working like a broken watch a broken digital uh, analogic watch where the um, where the the indicator doesn't move more than one minute. Uh, when we have to prepare the sperm, normally we mix uh, sperm with special culture media. Initially, uh, our purpose, our goal is to eliminate the, the seminal plasma and other constituents of sperm. And then we use the special media that will uh, that will help us to enhance the sperm properties and turn it more uh, stronger uh, with a better ability to fertilize the egg. Uh, obviously, this depends on the quality of the sample. It, it will depend on what we want to do with the sperm. If we're, do it, if we're preparing the sperm to do an IUI or whether we're preparing it to do a NICSI or to freeze it, obviously the procedures are different. But roughly speaking, there is a series of centrifugations where we can we are able to separate the the spermatozoa from the rest of the constituents of the sperm the spermatozoa stay here at the bottom uh, of the test tube and then we suspend it in special culture media and let the mobile sperm um, swim to the surface of the media where we are able to literally fish the most motile strong and theoretically also more viable sperm spermatozoa okay um, and what about the egg well uh, we get the eggs uh, from an oocyte aspiration uh, since this presentation is about what happens in the lab I will not go in many details about that but roughly speaking we give uh, drugs to the to, to the patients uh, in order for to make their ovaries produce more uh, follicles than they would do in a normal physiological cycle so instead of developing just one or two follicles like every woman with a with a normal ovarian activity does we get patients producing a lot of follicles with a lot of, uh, of eggs inside of them hopefully uh, then we go under sedation this is a general anesthesia that lasts for about 10 minutes we go with a very fine needle and their ultras ultrasound control and we aspirate the content of the follicles. Just remember that the ultrasound scan allows us to see through the skin, but it doesn't allow us to see it microscopically. So when we see when, what we see in the ultrasound scan are sort of bags of liquid. We don't know whether there's an egg inside or not. The only way to confirm it is to look to aspirate this liquid and look at it under the microscope. 
and then uh, salty eggs are aspirated directly from the ovaries into a tube. This is a procedure, this is a schema of the procedure. So the gynecologist goes here, this is the vagina, this is the uterus, this is one of the ovaries. And so they puncture every ovary and they aspirate the content of every follicle into this test tube, um, this test tube. This is a, an image of an actual procedure taking place at Ferti Centro. Then uh, we have this, um, this, uh, we, we have these tubes on a table whose temperature is controlled to be at 37 degrees. We're always measuring and controlling for uh, the temperature to be stable. And then under uh, what we call a stereo microscope, we start looking for the eggs. We spill the... Um, we put the, the the follicular liquid into these dishes and then we put the dishes under this stereo microscope and with this small pipette we start looking for for the the cumulus what are the cumulus those are uh, the complex between the eggs and the granulosa cells that surround them because inside those follicles there is liquid lost in the middle of that liquid there are the eggs but the eggs are not uh, like uh, they are they are not alone they are surrounded by the granulosa cells and so sometimes we see the cumulus which is a complex between the egg and the granulosa cells but they the egg is so surrounded by cells that we cannot immediately tell whether the egg is viable or not. Sometimes it is very easy to see, sometimes it is not that easy. And so we have to prepare the eggs in order to confirm whether they are uh, in the correct state of maturity and so on. It will all obviously also depend on whether we're doing a classic IVF or an ICSI. But uh, so this is how the follicular liquid looks under the stereo microscope. As you can see, eggs are too small. Uh, we can see uh, these small dots here, but we can but we need to observe them under the stereo microscope in order to see if there is an egg inside. For example, in these two cases, we have eggs surrounded by cumulus cells. This is exactly what we see when we are looking for eggs. And so we, we take each one of these complexes of cumulus uh, and granulosa cells and we put them in another dish that will be incubator uh, incubated at 37 degrees and we 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 put all the eggs in a dish so we we literally are fishing for eggs on the many tubes that sometimes we get from an outside pickup for example in this case we have one two three these small dots are the egg four five six seven eight 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, you know, probably there was some, some other egg. Uh, I wasn't paying enough attention, but this is exactly what we see under the stereo microscope. You see the eggs are still very small dots in here, so it's very difficult for us to immediately tell whether they are mature eggs or not. We will have to check for that later on. So we pick these eggs and we put them into a plate and uh, the, uh, from that plate we put it we put those in special bench top incubators in the case of our clinics where they stay in a very controlled environment at 37 degrees 5% uh, oxygen um, and 6% co2 these are the perfect conditions for the eggs to um, to to stay uh, because that's approximately also the, the the amount of oxygen that exists in the fallopian tubes where the eggs are supposed to be fertilized. So, so after we collect the eggs, the next two hours are passed in this incubator. Then we start preparing the eggs to be fertilized. If we're doing a classic IVF, we will put the egg and its cumulus in a dish with 100,000 uh, moving spermatozoa. And so we let them incubating for 18 hours and on the day, the, the next day we will check for fertilization. When we are preparing to do an ICSI, we have to remove those cells that are surrounding the egg. So we're going to do what we call the stripping. Uh, so this is done with a very thin needle, a very thin tube, 
whose diameter is more or less the diameter of the egg. So this is an extremely delicate procedure. It has to be done by experienced embryologists. Uh, it, has, it is done mechanically uh, and with the help of an enzyme. So we put an enzyme, uh, the, the eggs inside an enzyme that called hyaluronidase. It will help do, to, do, to remove those cells, but then we have to go me mechanically and at the same time very softly and very carefully so we don't lose the egg, so we don't damage the egg as well. But we are able to remove, but, but at the same time we're able to remove all of the surrounding cells. Uh, but uh, while we, we're doing this, what are we looking for? We're looking for mature eggs, okay? Because women, when they are born, they have around 2 million eggs. Those are not viable eggs. Those are what we call follicular, uh, primordial follicles. When women, uh, by the age where they have their first menstruation, women only have 400,000 primordial follicles. And then, in every month, one of them goes to the, uh, many of them go to the maturation process, but only one of them is is ovulated um, and, uh, and is able to be fertilized. This is in a normal physiological cycle, okay? So what we are looking for here, when we are doing IVF, we are trying to do the same thing that happens in nature. So we are giving drugs, to, to stimulate ovaries to produce, instead of just one, multiple eggs. We normally like to work with eight or 10 eggs. That would be perfect. Sometimes if we can get 15, even better, 20, okay. From that higher, more than 20, maybe the patient's risk, the patient's health could be at risk. Nowadays, we have techniques to avoid uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but ideally, we like to work with between 8 and 15 eggs. So we give these drugs, we have multiple follicles developing, and we try to make sure that oh, we do ultrasound scans, we do estradiol determinations, progesterone assessments as well, all in order to see, um, to, to see the characteristics of the follicles and to see if they are like to have a mature egg and so when the egg when the follicles have at least 17 millimeters we trigger the ovulation when we are triggering the ovulation we are triggering the final maturation of the egg and so we are uh, artificially doing what happens uh, in nature with the LH peak LH is one of the hormones that is produced by uh, the pituitary gland well, I'm not going to bother you with these technicalities, but at the end of this process, after the final maturations, we should have a mature egg. And so this is what we're looking for. For example, here we have three different types of eggs. In this, in, on the left hand, we will see a germinal vesicle. Uh, there is a, a typo here, sorry, it's not uh, correctly written. Uh, so it's a prophase one egg, then we have a metaphase one egg, and then we have a metaphase two egg. So only the egg on the right is mature. Was some the egg of the middle and sometimes we can mature it in vitro the egg on the left side normally we can't do nothing about it because its development has arrested on a very early stage why does it happen well uh, it uh, why do some eggs don't reach the final stage of maturation uh, we actually don't know, okay? Sometimes it's a problem with the patient, sometimes it's a problem with the quality of the egg because at the genetic level, some eggs have errors that prevent them from reaching the final stage uh, of, the, um, of maturation. Sometimes it's a problem with the triggering. Some women are less sensible to the triggering, triggering medication. Sometimes it's an, a sign of um, ovarian, ovarian aging. Uh, sometimes uh, there are problems like uh, the polycystic ovarian syndrome and so on, where patients have a lot of eggs that are not mature. A lot of things can happen, but the most important, the take home message is that we're looking for the ones on the right side the metaphase 2x, the mature x. Okay, then we're ready to do the x. What is the, what is, what does x stand for? x stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. 
Where is that? It's a procedure where we pick just one spermatozoan and we will inject it inside the neck. Okay, it is done in the lab and it's a very delicate yet revolutionary procedure because before ICSI was invented, there, uh, there was virtually no solution for cases where uh, male fertility was seriously compromised. Now, it only takes one sperm for us to be able to fertilize an egg. Obviously, that sperm has to be viable, and sometimes it is very difficult to find a viable sperm in some men cases. But um, there is hope. And we've been having babies everywhere in the world, starting with cases with very few spermatozoa. Uh, so how do we do it? Well, we start to prepare the ICSI plate. Okay, this is a dish like like you can see here. This is actually from a real case. We put the eggs in these drops with a special culture media. We put the sperm in these strips. These strips have a culture media that will actually prevent sperm from moving too fast. So we can take a good look at them and fish the ones uh, and get the ones that have better characteristics. And so we we will then have to fertilize the eggs using a special microscope with a micro manipulator with two needles one on the left hand which is called the holding needle and one on the right hand which is the ICSI needle so one is there sort of, it's sort of a, a vacuum cleaner who holds the egg and the other one will pick uh, the egg the sperm and inject it inside the, the spermatozoa uh, inside the egg sorry uh, it is, uh, I will show you a video on how we do it. It's actually a very delicate procedure, and this is a real case done at 30 You can see here that the first thing, uh, sorry, uh, I was trying to put it. Okay, here we go. So the first th thing that we're doing is on the left-hand side, you will see the holding pipette. That, uh, that's the one that um, holds the egg still. Then uh, we have to, to put the egg in the right position. You see this, it's not very well visible yet, but there is uh, one small bulb here, which is called the polar body, that help us to identify how should we insert the sperm into the egg. Because if we don't introduce the needle in the right position, it can damage some structures of the egg. So a very important thing is to be able to uh, puncture the egg in the exact in the correct place. Otherwise, we risk damaging the egg and losing everything. Also, um, at the same, it is this is a very delicate procedure that we have to do quickly because if we take too long, it will it won't be good for the egg. And also, uh, we have to make sure that we're working uh, that the egg and the needle and uh, the holding pipette and the, the ICSI micro injection, they are all at the same level because an egg is a ball. You have to remember it. So we're like holding a ball with a small ball on top of it. Uh, and then we're puncturing that ball. So this is, let's see what happens. Let's see that the embryologist will start to rotate that ball, that egg. Now you can see the little small ball on top of it, okay? If we can take a look here, well, it's not very visible in the image. The sperm is already here. You see, um, it's a very small dot that you will see. And so the sperm is already inside the ICSI needle. And so what we're doing here, we're just preparing the egg to be injected. And now, Start with it. We are putting the sperm ahead. You can see. Here we go. The sperm is right here. Is moving. He's going uh, in the towards the egg, and you can see it. Now that he is on the tip of the micro injection pipette, we we start to perforate it. We press the membrane. We aspirate a little bit. The sperm goes back, and then we leave it here. And here it is, okay? So this egg has just been fertilized. And then we move on to the next egg with the next sperm. So we go and select another sperm, we, we, and we will fertilize uh, the, the next egg in the next droplet. And sometimes we have a lot of eggs, and, 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 and it takes a while for us to do it. So what do, do we expect to see them? Well,
well, after 18 hours, we expect to have a fertilized egg that looks like this with the two pronuclei, one from the male side, the other one from the, from the female side with the two polar bodies. That's, that's a sign that fertilization has occurred correctly. And then 24 hours later, we have two cells. 48 hours later, we have four cells. Eight, uh, 72 hours later, eight cells. Um, on day four, we have around 16 cells and the embryo is called morula. And on the fifth day, we have more than 100 cells and the embryo is called the blastocysts. Uh, here uh, at Ferti Centro and also at Procriar, we work, uh, we culture the embryos in these special incubators with built-in video cameras that allow us to do the... Um, to do the embryo culture uh, without any manipulation and so we insert the we inject the sperm into the egg and then we put the the embryo the, the fertilized egg inside the incubators and we can see in real time what happens next so we will see a video uh, i have a very technical a small technical problem i don't don't ask me why but the only way i can show you <laughs> is by doing this so this is a case where we have uh eight embryos okay the embryos uh, are developing under the embryo scope and you, we can see what happens you see that some of the embryos are starting to divide this is life happening in real time you see the embryos they are dividing uh, in two cells and in three and then in in four cells and in eight cells right now they are forming the morula and you will see that uh, almost all of them will form nice blastocysts okay the difference here is for example in the middle you don't see a blastocyst the embryo was trying to do a to form a blastocyst but he failed to do it so uh, the one in the middle is not a viable embryo while the other ones are very good prognosis embryos obviously not all cases go like this but hopefully uh, for example, in egg donation cases, we have on average four or five embryos that look like this, uh, like uh, good quality blastocysts. Obviously, if the patient is younger, we get a lot of these. If the patient is older, we, we're lucky enough if we get at least one of these. Uh, one of these embryos, I think it was this one, is already born. So the other ones are still in the freezer waiting for... Um, for the patient to move on with its embryo transfer. Then we get the embryo and we transfer it into the womb. How is that done? Well, it's a very complicated procedure that is done. It, that should be done by a specialized gynecologist. We use a very thin catheter. We will put the this this catheter diameter is only slightly larger than the embryo itself, and so the gynecologist normally, with the help of an ultrasound scan, or done before or during or just after the procedure they will put the embryo in the inside the womb in the exact place where it should implant okay it is a very 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 de delicate procedure it requires a lot of experience from the gynecologist and it's one of the most critical steps in the whole process because if it's not properly done we can lose everything else okay so it's a very delicate moment uh, when we do the embryo transfer, uh, then we see this small dot here that uh, it's actually the culture media with the embryo and, and we can see it and show the patient that her future family is already <laughs> on the making. Okay, what do we do with the remaining embryos? Well, we have to vitrify them. What's uh, vitrification? Well, uh, vitrification is actually a very complex procedure where we uh, replace all the water inside the embryos for a cryoprotecting agent. It is a, a very toxic agent that will prevent uh, ice crystals from forming and damaging the embryo. So we have to be real quick. So we start doing these very complicated procedures in the lab. Uh, we, this is done manually, so it requires a lot of experience from the embryologists. Uh, so 
we do these procedures to replace all the water by the cryoprotectant agent inside the embryo and then we immediately and very quickly dump it uh, into liquid nitrogen which means that the embryos will stay at minus 196 degrees. In order for you to have an idea, the cooling speed is minus 23,000 Celsius degrees per minute. This is crazy and it is done manually. Uh, it's a procedure that we do thousands and thousands of times every year that requires a lot of experience from the embryologists and it has a very complicated learning curve and it took uh, every nowadays it's um, it's the best system in the world nobody i don't think nobody's using slow cooling anymore but uh, and but it provides us with fantastic uh, um, uh, survival rates with embryos we're now having 98 percent of survival rates with eggs we're having 90 percent of survival eggs which is incredible and allow us to have a lot of flexibility and then we have to do the reverse process when we are warming the warming speed is plus 42,000 degrees per minute which is also crazy so we have to just dip the um, the, the frozen embryo in this special culture media and we have to do the opposite procedure start to quickly replace the the cryo the toxic cryoprotectant agents for to the water so the embryo can can recover his its initial characteristics it looks complicated and it is complicated but everybody's doing it now and we have wonderful survival rates and then the embryos are put in containers like this one this is one of our containers at Fertie Centro. we get the embryos uh, and eggs are stored here at minus 196 degrees you can see they we we leave the the straws in in gas nitrogen uh, so every straw has its own place every straw is properly identified and we have two of these containers so uh, and a lot uh, several smaller ones so uh, it is uh, crazy to think that we have thousands of potential human beings in containers like this in IVF clinics all over the world. What else do we do in the lab? Well, we do a lot of embryo testing uh, in order to see, for example, if an embryo has a normal genetic constitution. Uh, we do what we call the PGTA, pre implantation genetic tests for a nucleus by next generation sequencing. And, and why do we do that? Because uh, sometimes patients do IVF, they transfer an embryo, it doesn't implant, the result is negative, the embryo was apparently very good and we don't know why did we get a negative. Was it the embryo? Was it the uterus? Or is it an immunitary condition, a nematological disorder? What could be the explanation? So PGTA, uh, preimplantation genetic test for a new pleuritis, help us to understand it. And obviously, uh, we, this is a graphic from iGenomics. iGenomics is one of the most well-known labs uh, doing PGTA analysis and where they have seen that, uh, that when we are transferring embryos without doing PGTA, so we're just assessing embryos based on their morphological characteristics, uh, we have in sort of this pinkish color, we have like 45% below 35 years, 40%. Um, I mean, you, you have these pregnancy rates. However, when we are able to select embryos that are genetically normal, when I say generically normal, uh, I have to, to say that have a normal chromosomal constitution, we will see that pregnancy rates are more or less the same for all age groups. Why does that happen? Because a normal embryo has a very uh, higher implantation potential. This is not all, all about the chromosomes. The uterus also plays a role. And inside the embryo, there are other structures that also play a role. But we know that if we are transferring normal embryos, the odds of having a baby are way higher. Okay, this is why, uh, for example, nowadays we are um, counsel, uh, advising patients uh, above the age of 39 to do PGTA because there we will be able to see uh, whether their embryos are viable or not. 
this is a complex issue probably there will be some uh, webinars dedicated to this so i will not uh, talk uh, spend much time talking about it because we do have mosaic embryos and so on uh, so, but um what we all the one of the most important messages that we have to that we always tell all, our patients is this in medicine uh, pgt embryo testing by pgta helps us to understand whether an embryo is good or bad but we cannot transform a bad embryo into a nice one okay so medicine is not yet at least capable of doing it knowing whether the embryo has a good or a bad prognosis is a very important information it can help patients making decisions it can help us direct the diagnosis of uh, previous implantation failures but it will not increase the odds of pregnancy so if the embryo is not viable it is not because we did a pgta that the odds of pregnancy will increase this that we have here is just the consequence of just transferring normal embryos but uh, obviously after transferring all embryos in, uh, of a group the number of good quality embryos that are implanting on the womb will be the same okay this is an important message there are also other tests that we can do on embryos one of them is pre-implantation genetic testing for structural rearrangements this is a very particular particular type of genetic abnormalities where patients are carrier of um, some a part of their of a chromosome is uh, is placed on another chromosome and the other way around so they had what we call a balanced translocation so they are normal persons because they have all the dna that they require but uh, they have a very high risk of transmitting a disequilibrated and imbalanced uh, translocation and so we need to check the embryos to see if they are normal or not PGT uh, preimplantation genetic testing is also very important for monogenic diseases. For example, in families that have diseases like uh, Huntington disease, uh, paramyloidosis, well, many uh, monogenic diseases. Th these are diseases that only affect one gene. Uh, in some cases, they have a 50% risk of passing it to their babies when their dis that disease is called an autosomal dominant disease or maybe a 25% chance when both elements of a couple are carriers for the same rare disease. So in those cases, we can create the embryos, do an analysis and see whether they are carriers of the mutation or not. And if they're not carriers of the mutation, we can, after that, check if they are chromosomically normal or not. So we can do the two tests in just one step by testing the embryos. In the IVF lab, what we do is this. We make a small hole in the embryo with the laser um, system, and then we aspirate the content of the embryo, uh, and we send it to, to a genetics lab. Okay, but this is not all we do. Obviously, there are some procedures that I've not talked about. I don't want to bother you too much, but uh, working in the lab is a very systematic and sometimes obsessive job. Okay, we have to control the temperature, we have to control the volatile organic compounds, we have to control humidity, we have to control CO2, we have to control lots and lots of different parameters, and we have online systems uh, registering those temperatures and those parameters continuously. And we have alarm systems. For example, in the middle one, there was an incubator that was disconnected, and it uh, and it was immediately signaled in red. Okay, so we get a message in our cell phone stating well, if everything is out of normal. Okay, so we we are always checking the stability, the conditions of our embryo culture. We have quality management systems in place. In Portugal, those are actually legally required. And we have a total traceability of culture conditions in both of our clinics. Uh, we 
every day we check for temperature of all surfaces we have calibrated devices that are always that we always use before starting to work because we have to make sure that the temperature is the correct one we also check for ph uh, of the culture media um, and so we routinely check for a number of parameters that allows us to be sure that our embryos are being cultured in perfect conditions okay and then on top of all of that we have to to the kpis uh, what are these those are key um, key parameters in the lab uh, so th those are what we call kpi stands for key performance indicator so we have to we have there are international consensus uh, of experts that have defined values that uh, the, on the, on the left column this is the minimum that we have to reach and uh, on the right hand this is what we have to reach to be considered good okay and we have to monitor every single one of these parameters because those are indicators of good uh, that everything is going well in the lab and if we are we know that if we're getting these parameters in our daily practice we're working well okay and so we're going to get good results we're going to get good embryos and obviously nothing of this guarantees a pregnancy but what we have to do in the IVF lab is to optimize the conditions of culture, the conditions for embryo development, so we can give our patients the best possible chances. And this is what we do on a daily basis. We have lots of people always going through statistics, running these numbers, seeing if there is any tendency in the bad side. If there is something wrong, we immediately take action so we can be sure that everything goes well. And so um, this is um, bottom line, what we do in the lab. We, th we try to overcome the difficulties that nature uh, gives us. So uh, when everything goes well, the spermatogenesis uh, occurs in the testes. So the men are producing, sp men are producing spermatozoa. Uh, they are being matured in the epididymis, which is a part of the testes inside the testes. The sperm, the mature sperm are, are being released uh, by ejaculation. They are entering the vagina, crossing the cervix, reaching the uterus, and then the tubes. They are recognizing the egg, fertilizing it, and then embryos are dividing. Uh, uh, in the correct way they are implanting and we have a baby and so this is what happens in the normal way what are what is what are assisted reproduction techniques for well when there is a problem in one of those steps we adapt the, te the best technique to that problem. For example, if we have a, a slight quality issue with the sperm or if the sperm doesn't get through the cervix uh, and it just needs a little help, we can do an intrauterine insemination. Or for example, if it is a single lady trying to get for a baby, obviously before the age of 35, chances of an IUI working with donor sperm are a lot higher than after the age of 35. Um, or if it's a lesbian couple uh, and so on. So IUI is a very good first line approach for uh, not so serious cases. If there is a problem, for example, with the tubes uh, or um, also a problem with sperm quality uh, and uh, and we have to make sure uh, or we need to make sure that the embryo uh, has a good quality or if IUI has failed before, well, there are multiple uh, number of situations. We can do a classic IVF situation. If that um, if there is a male side issue and we need or we have uh, we need to make sure that the fertilization occurs in order, for example, to do a preimplantation genetic test or if we're working with frozen eggs. Uh, so uh, if we're if the, we're not sure if the sperm is capable of fertilizing the egg itself, 
then we do the micro injection the step that i showed you a moment ago with that video uh, and so we do a nixi if for example uh, the man is producing sperm but they're not getting to the outside of the testes so he has as well spermia but he has sperm inside the testes we can do a testicular biopsy uh, to uh, call, uh, the acronym for that is a tz where we go inside the testes get the sperm and inject them directly into to the into the egg and so we can overcome the different uh, types of difficulties that nature uh, poses to us so uh, in the IVF world we have all of these solutions obviously if we think that uh, humans are not a very fertile species a man and a woman have uh, that don't have any health problem that are both 25 and try to get a baby naturally they have a success rate of 25 percent so we don't start on a very good number okay nowadays if we go to statistics all over the world we can see that we're easily over 30 percent uh, in many cases over 40 percent in egg donation cases over 60 percent and so uh, this is what we're getting with uh, ivf techniques uh, all over the world so in some cases, we are more than doubling the, the odds that nature gives us, but obviously we're still not at 100%. So we still depend on chance. It is obviously a lottery. Our job in the lab is to make sure that all the odds are in favor of our patients. And this is what we do on a daily basis with a lot of work. We started fight, fighting nature 40 years ago. A long way is gone. It was 43 years ago, sorry, uh, when Louise Brown was born. Robert Edwards won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2010 uh, for his discovery of the, the uh, for, when, for IVF, for, for discovering IVF. We still are fighting nature, okay? Uh, I like to quote uh, one of the most well-known embryologists in the world because he was saying that every single person that works in IVF feels like they have, they've got the best job in the world. This is exactly what we feel because at the end of the day, we all want the same. And so good luck. And remember, we're here for you. We're working every day for you. Thank you. And thank you so much indeed. As always, you've been brilliant with your presentation. And of course, uh, you have explained everything. So I'm very happy indeed that you are back. Okay. Oh, and as you can see, we have plenty of questions ready. Uh, it's actually a kind of conversation over here. So uh, okay. let's start with the questions then. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Wonderful. So the first question is from Margie. What is the state of the in vitro maturation of M1X? Well, uh, there is a technique called in vitro maturation that we sometimes use. Um, obviously, uh, it's it's not the first line approach. Okay, we always try. Uh, we only try to. Mat uh, a few years ago, when we started talking about IVM in vitro maturation, um, we thought there were some people defending that it would be useful for some cancer patients where we we need to to retrieve eggs at a very a very early stage of development or in some cases where patients have uh, a risk of developing an hyperstimulation syndrome and so uh, we were developing uh, we were maturing uh, eggs in vitro it's uh, it still works it's a technique that uh, that can be helpful in some very specific groups of patients however its success rates are not as good as um, the other x okay so uh, if the patient is at risk for uh, having an hyperstimulation syndrome it's preferable to trigger with decapeptil or um, some agonist of the GnRH uh, hormone and because that will virtually uh, eliminate all risk of um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome uh, w at, the, uh, at the same time allowing us to have uh, mature eggs without putting the health of the patient at risk also if we have cancer patients 
freezing of variant tissue is, is providing better results, in my opinion. There could be someone thinking otherwise. Uh, but so we can do it. We do it when there's nothing else we can do, but it's always sort of a, a resource technique. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the very first question. And of course, your thorough answer. And we have plenty more questions coming up. So let's have a look at this one. I have, I have heard that some labs in the US freeze not just M2, but M1 and germinal state eggs in the hopes to use them later on when the means of maturation have evolved. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> okay. But um, I mean, it's a question of faith in science, okay? So as long as patients know that what we are doing, or at least what they are doing, uh, as long as patient may, patients make informed decision on that question, so uh, we, we don't have to, we, we cannot put too much hope on this, okay? On the light of the actual scientific knowledge, M1 X could be maturated to in vitro, or to, to M2, to mature eggs, germinal states. It's not impossible, but it's way more difficult. And both have way fewer chances than uh, than other than than the M2 eggs. So um, I don't think it, 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 there is an indication to freeze these immature eggs because also we don't know one of the possible reasons why they are immature is because. Uh, uh, an important part of them would most likely have uh, genetic abnormalities, but obviously uh, we don't know what science will bring us in the future. But anyway, I wouldn't put too much hope on this. Um, I wouldn't say it is necessarily wrong, but it should be seen as an experimental procedure and not something to be used as part of routine care. Right. Thank you once again, of course. And let's have a look. Margie has added one more question. So how often do the eggs get damaged during ICSI? Uh, it's extremely rare. Okay. If a lab is experienced while doing ICSI, I would say it almost never happens. Nowadays, uh, we have, uh, I don't remember by heart, but uh, it's uh, it's very common to have uh, more than 90% and some lots and lots of cases with 100% fertilization. And so uh, with experienced embryologists doing ICSI every day, I would say the odds are virtually no obviously no one can say never but uh i would say that is extremely unlikely i can even give you a percentage is certainly less than one percent but i cannot give you a number and amazing thank you so much once again all right let's have a look we have definitely more to come did I understand correctly? For ICSI, the sperm should be entered into the ball type area, or just the ball type area needs to be in a particular position. The ball type area, it's the egg, and it has to be in a particular position so we can insert the sperm without damaging other structures. Okay, so when we think of the egg, it is a ball, okay? A ball with a very small ball on top of it. Uh, that very uh, small ball is a byproduct of the egg development. It's called the polar body. It is not used for the, the embryo development. It will not participate on that. But And so we have to insert the sperm inside the egg, inside that ball. Okay. <laughs> oh, the ball on top is not used. It, it's a byproduct. We don't use it. Um, it's just an indicator that the the egg has developed well. It's a mature egg, but then uh, it will go away. It will not be part of the embryo that will be formed. All right. Again, thanks so much mm -hmm. for that one. And let's have a look. And of course, as you can see. Thank you from Karen. <laughs> and the question is, so can you say something about the grading quality of embryos? What's the highest? Well, there are multiple grading systems. Um, in Europe, uh, there are maybe 
two grading systems that are more used. One of them is the Istanbul consensus. It, it, there was a meeting in, in Istanbul where a lot of specialists from all over the world uh, got together and defined a series of parameters that should be used to classify embryos. However, for example, here we prefer to use the Asaber system, which is also very used in Spain. It's more maybe a cultural thing. We feel more comfortable classifying embryos according to that classification. And we also classify our embryos according to morphokinetic parameters, uh, namely the kit score grading with the embryoscope, which is yet another uh, grading classification. But we, the most important information here is this. When we are classifying embryos, uh, there is always a certain degree of subjectiveness. Okay, so different embryologists looking at the same embryo might have different opinions. Okay, we we don't know, uh, we are humans, and the human eye see, uh, doesn't always see the same things. There are, uh, we're actually taking part of some, in some research studies where, uh, but there are research being doing, being done, there is research being done uh, in lots of parts, in many places in the world, to, uh, towards the, um, the automatize, uh, automatizing the, the, the embryo grading system. So towards automation of the, the embryo grading system. So uh, we're working on that. And when I say we, we're, I say science is working on that. Okay, we're doing our very small part of it, but uh, it's still very dependent of inter-individual subjectivity. But obviously when, uh, when Every clinic has its own grading system, and every embryologist knows, based on his experience, what are the good embryos and the bad, uh, the, the not so good embryos, the better prognosis embryos, and so on. This is something that we acquire with experience, but obviously it has a lot of subjectivity. But uh, so we obviously have to rely on the embryologist's opinion. Every clinic has its culture, it's, uh, they know what they are used to have, but uh, at the end of the day, um, and obviously we have to have criteria, what embryos should we freeze or should we transfer, what embryos uh, should we classify as non-viable, okay, we have to think about that, but, uh, and so this is what grading embryos is for, but we have to acknowledge that different people can have different opinion on the same embryo. <laughs> And again, of course, thank you so much uh, for a yet another incident. And actually, while we are talking about quality, how to choose the best blastocyst to be transferred? Well, uh, <laughs> that's the million dollar question. Okay, so um, here uh, at Ferti Centro and also at Procriar, uh, what we do, uh, since we do the embryo culture in the embryoscope, we see the formation of the embryo. Uh, the embryoscope is the name of the incubator with the video time-lapse system. This is where we get a video camera filming the embryos 24 uh, continuously, uh, 24 hours a day. So um, the best blastocyst has to be as to result for a, from a very good embryo that has divided in the correct way without having problems, uh, intermediary problems, reaching the blastocyst stage in time, having a good expansion and having good morphological characteristics, okay? Sometimes it is not easy. This is why automated systems based on artificial intelligence are starting to, to show up in the market because uh, we know that there are things that the human eye can't see, okay? I don't think we've, we're there yet, okay? In my opinion, the human eye is still the best system to identify the best blastocyst, but we'll eventually get there, okay? I don't think there's any reason why to, to, believe, uh, to believe otherwise. I think ultimately uh, it will be possible to have a machine indicating us what is the, the best blastocyst. 
I honestly don't know if I'm going to trust that machine because we do rely a lot in our personal experience after many years of looking into embryos every day. But, um, but that's it. I mean, uh, sometimes we think this, that happens a lot, for example, in PGT, pre-implantation genetic testing um, treatments. Sometimes we look at, at the blastocysts and we say, well, this is the best one. And then when we get the results from the PGT, it's not the best, the, the, the one that looked best that has a normal chromosomal constitution. That happens a lot. Okay. So we're always learning. We're always getting experience. Uh, time lapse is a, an incredibly useful tool uh, that we that allowed us to make a big step in this direction. But uh, at the end of the day, the truth is that nobody knows. I would say that the best blastocyst is the one that has been tested, that is that has been found to be euploid, meaning that it has a normal chromosomal constitution, and um, and that's it. I would say uh, I I would prefer to rely on the results of PGTA instead of embryologist's opinion to classify the best blastocyst. Obviously, sometimes that's not possible, that's expensive, that's invasive. And so in those situations, we have to trust our, sometimes even our instinct, but obviously our parameters, our um, systematic observation and registries and our experience. And again, thank you so much for a thorough answer, of course. Um, okay, more questions are coming uh, are coming up, so let's have a look. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is used on fertilized egg, correct? At what time could you explain the process and its goals? Well, uh, well, it will take me another hour to, to, to answer this completely, but I will say it very quickly. Yes, it is done on an embryo, which is a fertilized egg. It is done on day five or day six, meaning at the blastocyst stage. How it is done, we use a laser, a sort of a, a laser ray that will make a hole in the embryo. And via that hole, we will insert a very small aspiration needle that we use to remove around five cells from the embryo. Those cells are then sent into a genetics lab and we will assess the genetic, the chromosomal content of those cells. We know that a human being has to have 46 chromosomes, uh, so it will be either 46, uh, it's to have 46 chromosomes and um, it will be either a boy or a girl. We're not doing this uh, to, for the gender identification, it's not allowed in Europe uh, unless for a medical reason, but we know that the embryos have to have a normal constitution. Okay, If the embryo has an extra chromosome, for example, the most common chromosomal disorder is trisomy 21, where we have three 20 chromosomes, sweet, three 21 chromosomes, uh, and in that uh, in that case, that embryo is not considered to be viable. But obviously, there is a chromosome missing. We can also have, for example, a monosomy 21 or 20 or 10 or whatever, um, and so we we need to know uh, uh, the the genetic constitution of the embryo. So we get. We, so we culture, we create the embryo, we culture it until day five or six, we do that hole with the laser ray, we remove the cells, we freeze the embryo on that same day, we wait, we wait about three weeks for the genetics result, and then we will know which embryos are viable and which are not, okay? Obviously, there are situations in between where we have mosaic embryos that have different cell lines, namely uh, a normal cell line and the, an abnormal cell line. Nowadays, the um, scientific research, the most recent studies indicate that most mosaic embryos are actually viable. It's a question of defining the cutoff for the degree of mosaicism from above which we consider the embryo not valid, uh, viable. 
this is something that the genetics uh, labs work a lot and we have to rely on their work it's their specialty okay we just have to give them the embryos and wait for their conclusions and as always <laughs> let's, <laughs> first, let's have a look okay next question is from jessica would you consider this sample suitable for natural pregnancy so dna fragmentation 22 percent motility 55 morphology normal form eight percent concentration 43. Uh, i would need more information but yes <laughs> okay so uh i don't see any parameter that's outside uh, normality i can imagine that concentration is 43 millions instead of 43 percent but um apparently everything is okay but obviously we need to think about the egg we need there are other parameters that can that might need to be assessed okay but in principle this uh, these values, assuming that concentration is 43 million per milliliter, uh, are all normal. Understood, of course. Thank you so much. And then let me just remind everyone that if you'd like to get in touch with uh, Dr. Vladimiro, uh, there is a way, of course, I will send you a link in a minute. And that way you can find out a bit more as well, I guess. Uh, but because, of course, I get that uh, Dr. Vladimiro will need more details, as he mentioned. Okay. Um, but, of course, it's possible. OK, um, let's have a look. Uh, next question is, if there is DNA fragmentation of 40 percent, is ICSI still viable? Yes, uh, actually, DNA fragmentation is a very, how to say it, um, it's, it's, it's sometimes a very frustrating parameter because um, we don't have, really have a way to make it go down. Obviously, we can use antioxidants, we can give special medication and so on. It is very associated with lifestyle factors, exposure to, um, to, to pollution, to, uh, to alcohol, smoking and so on. So it's, a, it's very uh, di directly related to lifestyle issues. But uh, we do have patients that even after moving on with a very healthy lifestyle that are controlling the exposure to potential agents, they, all, they still have high DNA fragmentation. So for those cases, ICSI is actually indicated. Uh, there are studies that seem to indicate that ICSI yields better results than classic IVF in samples with high DNA fragmentation index. Um, that's not, um, I mean, that's not something that undisputable. Okay, we uh, apparently there is there is some ev some evidence in that direction, but we cannot be completely sure. Um, we would do at our clinics. We would do ICSI in such a case. Obviously, we would start to. Um, to advise these patients to take action in terms of lifestyle, antioxidants, and so on. If that didn't result and we end up still with 40% of DNA fragmentation, this is actually not too much. I've seen a lot worse, okay? We would do the ICSI anyway, because the egg also has some capacity of repairing uh, the DNA fragmentation problems in sperm. We know that an healthy egg will most likely be able to to correct these problems um, we will have to take a look at the, at the couple uh, also at the x side because if the patient the female patient is for instance 38 or 39 it's probably better to to move on anyway than to lose time trying to work on the male side and lose ovarian reserve on the female side. It's always a very hard call for the gynecologist to make. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, if patients are young, we can try, we should try, uh, okay? Uh, if we've reached a certain point where uh, these measures have had no result, uh, it's preferable to move on and do ICSI and, and, and hope that the egg could correct uh, these problems. There, there are also techniques that, of sperm selection that theoretically can help us to, to identify 
the better sperm or the sperm that are less likely affected by DNA fragmentation but the evidence available are, is not so good and so it's always uh, arguable whether those methods really work or not okay there are plenty of systems in the market I will not uh, start discussing all of them because it will be a, another debate but um, I don't think there is strong evidence towards any system yet there are some systems with promising results and again thank you so much yeah. uh, of course there are some many many questions that mm -hmm. uh, would require longer periods of time okay <laughs> but uh, i guess we can still have a look at some more right dr vladimiro uh so here's the next one so is the quality of sperm reduced when frozen and then defrosted well it depends on the sperm uh usually no okay uh, unless we have because uh sperm we've been freezing sperm for decades now for i believe for more than 30 years now and so we have a lot of it we when when i say we i i'm saying the ivf world and so um we have a lot of experience freezing and warming sperm and it has been shown that sperm preserves its characteristics can preserve its characteristics for a real really long time uh, we actually believe uh, we don't even know whether there is a limit for uh, from sperm preservation okay so obviously if we have a sperm that is that has a borderline quality of sometimes we have patients with what we call cryptozoospermia with very poor quality or very few numbers or morphological abnormalities and so in those bad quality samples freezing can have an impact um, but usually um, it, it shouldn't have an impact on, on the quality of the sperm so I would say that I can give you a number but maybe to 98 or 99 percent of the patients freezing uh, and uh, working with frozen sperm wouldn't have an impact it's always it's only for those cases with very poor sperm quality all right again thank mm -hmm. you so much and actually let's have a look at the next question okay uh so do you think that with freezing embryos for example for pgta purpose can damage an embryo should we avoid it or is it safe nowadays well, we've been doing that a lot, okay? And there are, especially in the United States, a lot of clinics that do it routinely. Um, I would prefer to, to do the biopsy on fresh embryos. If that's not possible anymore because the embryos are already frozen, um, we're comfortable doing it, uh, okay? We, for example, at our clinics, we've done many cases like this. Maybe it was just luck, but uh, we've never lost an embryo uh, that was frozen, that was warm to the PGTA, that was frozen again and warmed again. Uh, okay, so in order to be transferred. Um, obviously, the more we manipulate an embryo, the bigger the risk of losing it in the middle of the process. We, we cannot, uh, that's obvious. Uh, but uh, I would say that with the, with the survival rates that we're having in vitrification techniques nowadays, it seems perfectly safe to do it. Um, still, I would prefer to do it in, frozen, in fresh embryos, but like I said, we do it a lot and, uh, and, and, and we, really, we, we, we really do it a lot of times in, in embryos that were previously frozen and we never had a problem. Maybe we were, we were just lucky, I don't know. Uh, but a lot of people is doing that. For example, in the United States, I know clinics that are uh, freezing all the embryos. And then once a week, they do all of their biopsies. And so they warm all the embryos. They do all of their biopsies. They will freeze them again. Okay, that's just part of routine in many places. And I don't think that's wrong. Still, I would prefer to do it fresh. 
right, again, actually, you have started some conversation, actually, here we do have a question, okay, uh, so have a, let's have a look. So I have heard that in many American clinics, they now recommend frozen transfers over fresh with better results. Is this a trend that you have noticed at your clinic? Yes, uh, definitely, because we, we're now more focused on optimizing the, the uterine conditions um, than to, because when we are doing, uh, nowadays, a lot of the focus on medical research in this area is on the endometrium. And we're talking about windows of implantation, we're talking about progesterone influence, we're talking about many important parameters and since it is roughly the same to work with fresh and frozen eggs uh, sometimes it's preferable to, to to push the ovaries as hard as we can uh, and trigger the um, the ovulation with decapeptil or uh, with an agonist that will not allow us to do the the embryo transfer on that same cycle because it promotes an incomplete luteinization. Okay, it's, uh, uh, let's say the, uh, the corpus luteus uh, doesn't produce enough, enough progesterone to prepare the endometrium, but we can get more eggs and the better ovarian response. So it's preferable to push more on the ovarian side and try to get more embryos and better quality embryos and then on a different cycle and on a dedicated cycle aim to get a better endometrium. Also in egg donation cycles it's preferable to wait for a good stimulation on the, the egg donor side and get good quality embryos and then do the embryo transfer later instead of trying to synchronize like we used to do in the past uh, the the ovarian stimulation of the donor with the endometrial preparation of the egg recipient. Ten years ago we were all doing that in 100% of the cases. Now uh, I think probably 70 or 80% of egg donation cycles are done with frozen embryos because uh, it provides better results because most of these patients have have gone a long way until they get to the to the egg donation stage they have done they have had miscarriages they have had uh, multiple surgeries multiple failed attempts so uh, even at the environmental level their uterus has passed through a lot so it's preferable to optimize the endometrium conditions uh, before transferring so uh, we're definitely in favor of the freeze-all policies where we first we get the embryos, then we're going to transfer them. It's a tendency worldwide, I think in five or ten years, um, maybe, I don't even know if we would still be doing fresh transfers, but definitely frozen is the future. And again, wonderful. Thank you so much indeed. Okay, uh, more questions are coming in. So let's have a look at the next one. Okay, uh, we will go to ICSI again. Would you recommend ICSI where the sperm analysis is good? Are there any characteristics of semen analysis that would suggest to use ICSI? Well, uh, it's a question of opinion. Okay, um, it will all uh, normally, uh, according to all studies, ICSI. It should be reserved for cases with male side infertility. In our clinics, we also we don't like to take risks, uh, especially when we have very few eggs. We prefer not to risk uh, having a failed fertilization, for example, for random factors like two sperm entering the same egg or uh, not having a fertilization just because, just out of coincidence, okay? So ICSI is more efficient while fertilizing the egg. Obviously, there are studies indicating that children born from ICSI have increased risks of certain uh, disorders compared with classic IVF patients. However, what these studies have failed to prove until now is whether those differences come from the infertility cases itself, because the ICSI population is a population with, with a lot of... Uh, there is a reason why those men don't have enough uh, good quality sperm. And so uh, 
I think the take home message here is this. Every year there are millions of children born from Mixi that are perfectly healthy and Dixie is considered to be a very healthy procedure. So the choice of ICSI or IV, classic IVF will depend on many factors, including the past of that patient, including the number of available eggs, including whether we're working with frozen or fresh eggs, including the fact that we're doing PGTA or not. Uh, so there are multiple parameters to be analyzed. Um, I would say that there is a tendency to use ICSI a lot more than classic IVF. I know that a lot of people will kill me for saying this, but uh, in my personal opinion, um, I'm more in favor of doing ICSI when we have doubts, uh, when we are confident that we have a great sperm, very good quality eggs, okay, we can do uh, a classic IVF. However, maybe because we work in the private sector, maybe because we're getting a lot of bad prognosis patients, we end up doing uh, ICSI almost all the time. Excellent. And actually, mm -hmm. someone asked this question. You have just answered as well. Yeah. So which technique of ICSI, uh, sorry, with technique of ICSI being so good, would you recommend this over IVF? It has to be discussed on a patient basis. Okay. I cannot say this. Um, obviously, if there is a male factor, there's no doubt that ICSI is better. Uh, if uh, if the sperm is good and we have a good number of good qual of good looking eggs, maybe we can. Uh, classic IVF is as ex effective as ICSI. Actually, there. This is a question. We've been having studies on this topic for more than 20 years now, and results are generally the same. Results don't differ much between classic IVF and ICSI. But if we evaluate it on an individual patient basis, um, we can decide to to one or the other. But again, uh, I'm not, uh, I would say that uh, there is no definitive or clear answer to this. We have to evaluate. Uh, on an individual patient basis. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, of mm -hmm. course. Let's have a look, okay? Um, so where an egg disintegrates during the first hours, is this due to egg not being mature or can be some other reasons? Well, probably uh, I wouldn't say that the egg is not mature. I would probably say that the egg is not viable, okay? Um, I, I would say that uh, if uh, when well the expression disintegrates is probably uh, probably Karen means degenerates uh, which is normally a sign that that egg is not working well um, so the physiological functioning of the egg there there is a problem with the way the egg works so I would say that probably that egg is not viable and that's the reason why it would degenerate so I don't see any other reason, actually. Okay, again, thank you. <laughs> and so what do you think about embryo testing for egg donation IVF program? Is it worth it? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't uh, I don't agree with it. Uh, because um, let's look at statistics. When we have... Um, when we, if we go and see all studies uh, working with PGTA tested embryos, like the graph that I've showed you, you will see that if you transfer tested embryos, you will get 60 or 70 percent of pregnancy rates, which is exactly what you get in egg donation cycles. So, uh, I don't think it pays off the cost because egg donors are young and not only they are young, but also they have been selected theoretically because they are more fertile than general popu than the general population. So I would say that as a first line approach, embryo testing for egg donation um, doesn't make sense. Obviously, 
in a second moment. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, there was a case uh, a few months ago of a patient that had, uh, I think it was eight blastocysts, and we transferred her four, and she didn't get pregnant. All results were negative. And then we tested the remaining four embryos. And actually, the four of them were viable. So either we were really bad while selecting the embryos and we chose four bad ones, or there was a problem, another problem with that patient, which I believe it was the case. So embryo testing for egg donation could make sense if we want to direct the diagnosis to, to understand whether treatments are missing because of the endometrium or because of the embryo or, um, I mean, there, there are situations where it makes sense. But as a general first-line approach, I, I don't think it makes sense. I, I think it's a waste of money and it's obviously uh, doing invasive proce procedures to embryos that will not increase the, the pregnancy rates. Um, so we will definitely not advise it. Right. Thank you for yet another question. And let's have a look. So is this due to better rate of pregnancy? Is this trend of frozen transfer also present in Europe? Like uh, yes. the US? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't have specific. Uh, this is uh, a subjective opinion, okay, from what I talk to fellow embryologists from other European countries, but I think this is a worldwide tendency. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's have a look, okay, one more about XC. So how important is sperm fragmentation when using XC? Well, uh, we've talked a little bit about this already. Um, I would say, um, uh, if uh, a man has high DNA fragmentation, I would prefer ICSI over classic IVF. Whether it makes a difference or not, uh, I don't think nobody knows. But it would be just a cautionary measure, at least. All right. Thank you so much, of course, yeah. for that. Okay, next question is up here. I have heard that sperm quality is nowadays way worse than 20 years ago. Is there a reason for that? Uh, well, this is actually a very interesting question. It um, is indeed. Uh, first of all, um, there are studies uh, do, comparing uh, sperm analysis parameters through the years that seem to indicate that, in fact, there is a tendency downwards. Obviously, we cannot be sure whether the criteria that was used in all of those studies was the same throughout the years. Uh, it's actually very unlikely that it was the case. Um, still, um, we know that um, we don't see an increase in on male side infertility. Also, um, actually, it's uh, the 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 infertility incidence is rising, uh, especially because of women getting pregnant later in life. So we all know that. Uh, in the 60s, for example, in Portugal, the average age at, for women at the, at the birth of their first child was 25. Nowadays, it's over way over 30. It's maybe 31 or so. Uh, so that has a major impact on infertility, and that's the main cause. Regarding uh, that specific question, uh, it is on the same. Uh, we all know that. We live more stressful lives. We are more exposed to pollution. Uh, our lifestyle is getting more... Uh, we're having more dangerous lifestyles maybe than uh, 20 years ago. Um, so um, that could be a reason. But at the same time, um, I, I don't... Uh, I mean, I... I I have, I have some difficulty to to believe on this, to believe in this, because there are real. It's very difficult. I, I will give you an example. When we are comparing 
uh, sperm analysis from two different IVF clinics of the same patient done uh, a month apart, okay, sometimes we get very different results. And we know that the other clinic also works well, and they are very experienced. And we all know that men themselves, they have variations. Uh, winter <laughs> is different than summer, okay? Usually the sperm is better in winter than in, in the summer, and we don't know why. Uh, and so there are so many confounding factors that it is difficult to believe that this could actually be the case. I mean, there are many studies that seems to in, that seem to indicate it, but like I said, uh, on my personal experience, I don't see an increase in male side infertility. So either it is lifestyle or it is some confounding factor from the studies. I really don't know the details to answer this. Yeah, understandable, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, we will be slowly finishing. There are like a few questions left, so I guess we can still answer, right, Dr. Vladimir? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted to double check, but uh, let's have a look, okay, at the next question. So are there specific techniques best for women with low ovary reserve, different procedures? No, I mean, for um, women with low ovarian reserve, I would say... Um, well, yes and no. What, yes, because obviously we have to work in the medical protocol, the, the type of medication that we give the patients, the stimulation protocol, and so on. Once we get the eggs, uh, there's little we can do. Uh, we have to do that with them the same that we would do with an egg donation patient, okay? So uh, I would say that... Uh, what we can do to help these patients is before the eggs enter the lab. It's uh, on the medical side, the, med the ovarian stimulation side, and so on. Obviously, uh, with uh, women with low ovarian reserve can benefit from egg banking. We can do stimulations, freeze the eggs, accumulate the eggs, and then fertilize them all at the same time. Uh, since they are more likely to have lower quality eggs, we can do PGTA on the embryos that are formed. Um, we... Um, and we can resource to egg donation if we're not getting good quality eggs uh, from the ovaries. So there are multiple different approaches, but in the lab, while fertilizing the egg, it's actually the same to work uh, with a, a 25 year old, very fertile woman uh, and a 43 year old patient with only two or three eggs. We fertilize them the same way. Uh, maybe if we have fewer eggs, we prefer to do ICSI because it is more efficient. But uh, still, there might be there are clinics who prefer to do classic IVF instead. Uh, I mean, it, those are all respectable positions. Okay, we no one has the definitive truth on this. But um, I would say that uh, in terms of what happens in the lab, which is the title of this webinar, I wouldn't say there aren't much different procedures. And again, thank you so much. Mm. Now we will have a question back to ICSI and IVF, OK? Uh, okay. We have a few days. Uh, so I booked an egg donor and bought frozen donor sperm. Uh, Motel, I think, I'm not sure, what, 30? Mm -hmm. I prefer having classic IVF. The clinic normally does ICSI. They suggested 50 IVF, 50 ICSI. Is it a risk to do 100% classic IVF because of total fertilization failure? I mean, that risk will always exist, okay? Um, however, if we're working with uh, egg donors and sperm donors, uh, in principle, uh, it shouldn't happen, okay? Mod, mod 30 is way much than we need. I would say that mod 10 would, mod 10 would be already enough to, to do a, an ICSI in perfect conditions, even mod 5. So, but I mean, if you want to be sure, mod 10 it is. Uh, but um, so I would say that 
there is no reason to be afraid of doing classic IVF in a case like this. Obviously, if the eggs of the donor are frozen, we have to do ICSI. It's impossible to do classic IVF. Um, I would, um, I don't know, uh, I'm a little suspicious to talk about this. Uh, I always sleep better when we do ICSI because uh, we know that an, a good quality sperm has been selected and it has entered the egg and we know when it entered we will be able to monitor the embryo from that moment onwards we have a better control over the process but it's perfectly respectable to do classic classic ivf in cases like this i mean we're not even dealing with any fertility case here because the egg donor are not is not infertile the sperm donor is not infertile as well so if we're not doing classic ivf in cases like this we wouldn't be doing cl uh, classic ivf at all okay so this is sort of a textbook case uh, indication for classic ivf um, it's just more sometimes on the psychological aspect of trying to have um, an optimization of the process. To be honest, uh, I don't think it makes sense to do 50-50. Uh, I personally don't like it. We've done it in the past, but uh, I would either do it uh, all classic IVF or all ICSI. I wouldn't mix it. Excellent. Again, thank you so much, of course, uh, for yet another interesting question. And now we have a little bit of a technical question from Derek. Do you use a pole scope? Well, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> that's, that's a very easy question, a very easy answer. Um, there are multiple techniques that can theoretically help us in the lab. Uh, I believe that uh, a pole scope uh, is, some, is something that will show us um, that will show us how uh, some information uh, on the uh, on the genetics of the egg. Okay, um, I honestly don't know much about it, uh, but um, we. That's not something that we use. Uh, it also helps us to understand where uh, we should. It also helps us to assess the maturity of the egg and to help to help us identify uh, how we should do the ICSI in order not to damage the egg. OK, but um, I mean, I'm not a specialist on this. Um, it's something that we're not use, using on a daily basis. There are some promising studies uh, to, to try to find what we call the mitotic spindle with, based on this technology, uh, because the problem when we are doing an ICSI is that we might damage the egg by damaging the, the mitotic spindle. Theoretically, this kind of technology helps us to identify where it is. It is always, uh, usually always on the same place, but uh, so I'm not against it. Uh, I, I don't have personally enough experience to talk about this because we don't use it. Um, and I believe that it could be interesting. And uh, I've seen some interesting results from the use of this technology. Uh, However, those are still initial studies and we, we have to see where they go. All right. Again, thank you so much for yet another interesting question, of course. It's good to know. And let's have a look. Uh, Sylvia has added one more question. So what is the most complex assessment for genetic diseases of embryo before embryo transfer? <laughs> That's difficult to answer this one. Um, well, I don't know. Um, um, I mean, in the in the IVF lab, we always do the same. Okay, we do the biopsy, we take the cells out, and we send to the genetics lab. Um, so, the most complex work is done 
before the procedure because we need to know what are we looking for and um, and then uh, maybe uh, in terms of interpret inter result interpretation okay so we might need to um, to think about the results sometimes results are not clear uh, especially when we get mosaic embryos and so on uh, so i would say that the most complex work is done by the geneticist before the process is done. Um, in the IVF lab, we actually just just remove the cells and send to the genetics lab. Okay, so it's not really part of the embryologist's work to do the genetic assessment. It, Obviously, we all work in relationships as a team, uh, but um, so I would say that in terms, regardless of the genetic complexity of every case, we, in the lab, we always do the same, okay? We create embryos, we take cells out of embryos, we freeze those embryos, we send it to the genetics lab. Uh, then uh, it's either before and after that the real more complex intellectual work uh, on the genetics is done but um, so that's it <laughs> all right wonderful thank you uh, petra has one more question what are the risk of amber biopsy on day five are there any long-term studies about the health of children um, I don't know if there are long-term studies, um, at least not that I'm aware, um, but um, it has been proven that doing the, uh, the embryo biopsy on day five is way more safe than doing it on day three. Okay, so um, risks are a lot lower than doing it um, before that. Um, I think it is unlikely that there are uh, risks in the health of children. But remember, IVF itself, the first IVF baby is not even 43 years old, okay? We're talking about a recent, a relatively recent domain of medicine. So we have 43 years of experience doing IVF. ICSI was started was discovered in 92. So even for ICSI, we don't have even have 30 years. We have 29 years now. Um, so obviously, it seems quite a long time, but we are on the early days of all of these technologies. Um, there is no one aged 80 or 90 that was born from IVF. Okay, so we really don't. Long term here means, for example, in the case of embryo biopsy, it could mean like 20 or 25 years. I don't even know. But All so, right. so good. Okay, there are no reports of the opposite of risks uh, happening in children born from PGT even from the early days where biopsies were being done on day three embryos. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Are there like three questions, four questions left, I believe? Okay. And we will be finishing. Um, okay. And let's have a look. Okay. So does the egg ability to repair fragmentation and sperm decline where the woman is 40 plus or is it still work or does it still work in the same way? Uh, it declines a lot. <laughs> That's it. We can't. I can't give you a percentage, but it it definitely declines. Wonderful. Thank you so much of course, <laughs> for information. Then, okay. Next question is uh, uh is up from Karen. Does Zymod machine help select sperm with reduced fragmentation and low the centrifugal sorry process mm. keep fragmentation as low as possible? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know this machine. <laughs> I can Google it, but uh, okay. I, I I don't know. I've heard of it. I've never tried to use it. Um, like I said moments ago, there are lots of different systems and theories. Um, what I know is that uh, there are there are no no robust, no good quality large scale studies to 
for any of these techniques. It could be, maybe it's just a question of time, okay? We don't know, maybe with time, uh, so one of these techniques shows to be very useful. But at this very moment, uh, for example, uh, I've never used this one and I honestly don't know the results. Um, so who knows, but of course. Um, we have to wait for larger studies. But it's a very recent system. We have to see how it works. That makes perfect sense, of course. Still, thank you so much, uh, indeed. And mm. uh, let's have a look. Okay, so how are the uh, eggs after the steam procedure, particularly those retrieved at luteal phase? How are the embryos? Um, eggs, yeah, I mean eggs. Ah, okay. Uh, well, um, well, <laughs> I, I, I really don't understand the question, but um, I mean, embryos will always be the same, regardless if you do a dual stimulation or just one um, one egg pickup. Uh, so it, it's. Uh, I mean, if if Sally, if what Sally wants to know is whether the dual stimulation can be better than one just one stimulation or two consecutive stimulations, um, actually nobody knows. Okay, uh, we in my personal experience, I would prefer to do two independent good quality stimulations instead of a dual stimulation. However. There are patients uh, for which a dual stimulation uh, can be ben beneficial. But I don't think uh, that... Uh, what I would say is this. Um, first of all, this is relatively recent. It's a, sort of a tendency that appeared three or four years ago. Um, we don't know if it it makes sense, um, but the embryos uh, will talk for um, for themselves. So we have to um, to see the quality of the embryos, and I would say that's the final parameter. In principle, um, so in the what happens in the lab will be the same. We have to take a look uh, at the at the quality of the embryos. So I would say that's more of a medical question, whether it makes sense to do a dual stimulation or not, because normally it is done when patients have sort of two populations of follicles, one go, that goes ahead of the other one, that uh, of smaller ones. And so, uh, well, my personal experience I would say that it's preferable to do two independent stimulations. But from an embryo point of view, we, will, we really have to wait and see. That's amazing. As always, you, we are very thorough with all the answers. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. It's definitely great. Yeah. To, uh, this is a great session. And actually, uh, there are like, I think that this will be our final question okay let's have a look so i am considering to take two embryos frozen by a slow freezing method how many percent uh, will they have to survive the thawing process so uh slow freezing method has been abandoned these days obviously um, until 2010 2000, 2012 or so uh, we were still doing it so um and so and back in those days the survival rates were about 60 70 percent that that was the usual survival rate i would say 70 percent uh, was i mean it will depend whether they were blastocysts it will depend on the machine that was used for slow cooling uh, the, the slow cooling system because there were major differences in different devices that uh, that were available in the market in those days so it could range from 50 percent to 70 percent I would say it's unlikely that it is higher than 80%, okay? But, I mean, two embryos, they can both survive. We always, um, even our clinic in Coimbra, for example, is this for 19 years, and uh, we've had 
obviously from the beginning cases where all embryos survived so uh, it's when we're talking about 60 percent or 70 or 80 it's a question of luck uh, as well obviously but um, if it was vitrification we would obviously be more confident but uh, be more confident but we had hundreds or thousands of babies born from slow cooling uh, embryos okay so they might survive um, it's not the ideal but we can't do anything about it we have to work with what we have uh, and so um, I would say good luck for Beata um, or, uh, and um, there are good chances that they both survive I would say maybe 70% or 80%. Okay, fingers crossed for you. Of course, always fingers crossed to each and every one of you, that's for sure. And as I mentioned, that was, that was our final question with so many questions. Thank you so much. It's been a brilliant session, that's for sure. And well, uh, Dr. Vladimiro, I just want you to see some of the comments, uh, very interesting. And here, there's another comment, wonderful presentation. I have been curious about so many of these areas. Thank you for answering all the questions. It has been very helpful. Uh, what else can I really add? As you can see, a really great session, more thank yous are coming up your way. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for spending almost two hours with us tonight, everyone. And of course, Dr. Vladimir, for your time. Uh, I know you are a very busy man, so thank you so much. <laughs> but uh, anything else you would like to add? Okay. Nice talking to you, Caroline. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. It was, as always, a pleasure to be here. It's definitely uh, great to have you back. Okay. Thank you so much. And let Thank me you. just uh, mention, of course, this has been recorded, so you will have a chance to watch this again. As you know, it will be available on my Avi Fences tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. It's been a great, great session. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, we, it's like almost two hours and most of you are still staying with us. That That is definitely amazing. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for your incredible questions because of course that's why we are here. We love your questions and uh, Dr. Vladimir, as always, it's been a pleasure. So till our next event then, okay? Okay, bye-bye. Wonderful. Thank bye. you so bye -bye. much and thank good you. night. Good bye. Bye-bye.